Hi everybody and welcome back. So I finally have a little bit of time to spend at the bench and so I decided to dig out a project that I've been holding back for quite some time and this is actually going to probably be something for my personal collection and uh, I've always really wanted to do one of these and have one of these but any of you that look for these online you'll find very quickly that a lot of times they sell for a lot of money and uh, I just didn't want to put that kind of investment in something so my friend found this one for me and I told him to go ahead and get it we don't really know what kind of condition it's in other than physically it's not that great although the faceplate is good and that was my big concern was I didn't want this to be all scratched and ruined the knobs are loose it's kinda of like that uh, SA9800 that had a few issues but other than that physically on the outside I don't see anything that's not fixable and uh, before we get any further those of you who don't recognize this this is a Pioneer Spec 1 the Spec series was a series of high-end audio equipment made by Pioneer back in the 1970s and all of it was rack mountable and you could buy a special rack that would hold the components a lot of people use these at home but also they were used for instance in recording studios and for for monitoring and so forth so they're pretty high-end units uh, not as high-end as some of the stuff out there but they were very high quality very well built so uh, my cousin had one of these and I, I really liked the way it performed for him and I've always been looking out for one but you can see as we turn this around without hooking on to everything there we go and we shake the camera some unique things this is just a preamp but of course it has speaker terminals because you can actually have the, your speakers switching through the preamp so for instance this would come from your power amplifier it would then go out to your two sets of speakers and you could have your speaker switching and your headphones and everything all through the preamp so that's kind of unique uh, some people like to use this some don't because of course anytime you introduce anything into the speaker path it could affect the sound um, again that's a debate that a lot of people have but anyway you can see pretty basic on the inputs and outputs it doesn't have I don't think this has switchable for moving coil and moving magnet and this one is a uh, multi voltage you can switch it between 240 volts and 120 volts so just a nice good quality basic preamp so if that's interesting to you stay tuned and that's what we're going to work on and hopefully I'll have enough time between my busy schedule to get this thing completed okay I have not opened this up yet and I've taken all of all but the last two screws out so that uh, as you see this as I see this you're going to see this with me I don't know if this is going to be good or bad <laughs> but we'll take it apart and we'll find out all right here we go okay let's get the camera in here and see a little closer well so far doesn't look like anything has been changed uh, there's why the knob is loose probably just the hardware we can fix that the switches don't look so bad I mean they look pretty clean actually if you zoom in a little bit you can kind of see down here looks pretty good I mean it seems like all the corrosion and everything is on the outside and of course we're going to have to go through all of these transistors and check them I don't know without looking at the schematics on this I don't remember if this has any of those 2SA what are they the 2SA 
726s or something, they they always go bad in these uh, Pioneer gear, the older stuff, and then later on they went to a, a different one. But anyway, have these orange low noise capacitors that a lot of times will go leaky and go bad. So we'll have to, and low, low noise, low leakage, those will definitely, well, we're going to do a full recap, but definitely those. So far on the top, looks like it's pretty much untouched. Have a little crack on the board here. I guess that comes with age. So let's flip it over and look at the underneath. Okay, got the screws out of the bottom. Look at that. Once again, it looks pretty clean. All right, we definitely have something to work with from inside. This thing looks to be in really good shape, other than dirty and corrosion. Obviously, we're probably going to have to repaint the cabinet somewhat, but I'd much rather do that than try to rebuild broken circuit boards and deal with things like that. So, yeah, I think we're going to be good. So after a quick inspection, I think this thing's going to be safe to power up. And I did look around a little bit. And I noticed, I don't know if I can zoom us in enough to see it or not without it going out of focus, but if you look here are some of those 2SA726 transistors, and those are very problematic. You see these in a lot of Pioneer gear of this vintage, and they tend to go, they don't dead short, they usually will get noisy or they'll pop or they'll, the they'll fluctuate the, like how they conduct you'll get all kind of pop noise and just they need to be replaced if you see these in any gear out there the 2SA726 take them out replace them with uh, probably like a KSA922 or something like that I believe would be a good replacement but we'll get more into that later right now let's turn this thing on and let's check the power supply and make sure it's working and nothing's wrong with it. Uh, I'm connecting this up to the electronic circuit breaker. I have the current set real low. And the reason I'm using this is this will allow full power to the unit to get to be able to test the power supply. But if one of these capacitors decides to go high, go to high ESR and start to overheat and draw current, or one of these transistors decides to leak or short, this will trip it within four half cycles where I have it set right now. So we'll turn this on and we'll get it reset and then we'll turn this on and let's see if we get power. There we go. So the relay came in and let me get you situated here. And I don't know if we can see the camera like this, can we? So let's see if we can prop this up with something. I don't know. There we go. Might be a little easier to see. Okay. So, looking at the schematic here, looks like pin 6 is 62 volts. Pin 7 is negative 62 volts. 13 is 32 volts. All of these pins, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, is 48 volts. And then 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 is negative 48 volts. And then 14 and 15 is 23.4. So let's check some of those. So let's start with pins 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, which should be the 48 volts, positive 48. And so far, that's certainly not good, is it? You see that? Nothing. Okay. Let's look at pins 6 and 7. So here's pin 6. Nothing. Pin 7. Nothing. So we're not getting any voltage. So we have nothing getting up into here. So what we're probably going to want to do 
is flip this over and look at the actual rectifier circuit on the uh, fuse board. Okay, I have this flipped over to the bottom and we're going to just check our transformer to make sure there's power getting into all of this. And looking at the big schematic, we can see that here's our power going in. So we have the two green wires, which is pins 10 and 11. Then we have the two red wire, which is pins 13 and 12. So let's see if 12 and 13 have power and if 10 and 11 have power. All right, so you can see I have this connected on 11. Turn it on. And let's see. Okay. And if I look here, I have 48 volts AC. So I have that over there. And I'm getting it through the fuse over here. And let's see if this fuse is good. I'm also, so the fuses are good. So the 48 volt supply is good. Now let's go on those red wires which is going to be, once again, pins 12 and 13. So here's pin 12 and pin 13. 91 volts. So we have power there. 45, 45. Well, that's kind of weird, huh? How about that? <laughs> So on this side of the fuse, I have 91 volts. And on this side of the fuse, I have 45 volts. What do you know? We have some blown fuses. So let's take a look there. We'll zoom in. Yep, those look popped. Okay, so these fuses were popped pretty good. I mean, sometimes the filament will just barely open, indicating that it's just a little bit uh, over current, like if a capacitor gets leaky or something. But you can see this one blew out pretty substantially. So that tells me there was relatively high current at some point in time. So what I'm going to do is statically check this. If I go from pin 3, which is the ground or the common, to pins four and pin one. Those are your plus and minus voltages coming out of there, your plus and minus 62 volts. And normally there would only be 120 milliamps being drawn on either side here. Because this is, remember, this is a preamp. These things don't draw much current. So, okay, that's very high resistance. So there's no static short, at least. And that's a little bit lower, that, but that's still one mega ohm. So a million ohms uh, into 62 volts, I mean, you know, your current is going to be very small. So it could just be that one of these capacitors has developed high ESR, and as it warms up, it draws excessive current and pops the fuse, because these are half amp fuses. So I'm going to just pull this board and we're going to check these capacitors real quick for uh, ESR. Okay, the board is pulled. I doubt that there's going to be any power on these capacitors, but just in case, we'll go through and we'll use our little stinger cable and make sure all of the ter terminals have been properly discharged, which I think we're fine. Didn't think there'd be anything there. All right, get our capacitor wizard. And how about I get you in scene here so you can see. Okay. That one's good. Good. Those are good capacitors, at least as far as ESR is concerned. But you remember we checked the ESR on a cap on another project we were working on, but the capacitor ended up when you applied full power to it, it would short out. But this is a good little test, at least to give you an idea. 
because we remember we also checked for shorts first and then we checked for ESR. So there's nothing wrong with the capacitors on here for now. So it's obviously something not here. So let's put this back on. We'll go to the other side. Okay, after giving a quick ESR check on these capacitors, I didn't see any problems there and I didn't see any shorts. So we should be able to put a new pair of fuses in there and let's see what happens. Okay, so I'm low on half amp fuses, so I don't want to take any chances. So I'm disconnecting the two leads going out here. Now remember, we tested this for shorts and didn't see any shorts in here. And I just did diode check and just checked these diodes to make sure they weren't shorted. None of them are shorted. They're reading properly. So we're just going to kind of cut off the outside world from this circuit. And then we're going to see if we get power in here. Okay, time to give you an update here. This is really interesting. So what I found was I disconnected these leads, turned the power on, and it was still, it tripped the circuit breaker and it popped one of these fuses. So even though these capacitors and everything tested out good and the diodes tested out good, there was still some sort of a short. So what I did was I, I disconnected the electronic circuit breaker, even though I could have used the current limiter inside of it, I didn't have, I had a larger wattage bulb than I wanted. So rather than take this apart, I just moved everything over to this and I put a very low wattage bulb in there. When I turned it on, the bulb went full brightness, like it was dead shorted and it stayed that way for a little while. And as I was looking around, I noticed the bulb start to get dimmer. So I have it turned off right now. It's been off for a little while. We still have the wires going up to the power supply disconnected. And now if I turn this on after it's been off for a while, there you go. You see that little flash? That's what it should have done. So what that tells me is one of these capacitors was drawing excessive current as it was reforming. And now that it has reformed, everything's good. So let me connect these back up and I bet you that it will not pop the fuse and it will not make the bulb glow brightly anymore. So let's do that. Okay, we're reconnected. And like I said, this is an extremely good example of why you never just plug an old piece of audio gear in like this and just turn it on, even if it's solid state. I know a lot of people say, tell you to do that with vacuum tube gear, but it's every bit as important with solid state gear. Anything that has these old capacitors, because these capacitors needed to reform, <clears throat> they're, they're, they're working now, but we don't know how good they're working. And if you recall, I checked the ESR and the ESR tested very good on it. So it's not even that. It's, it's a chemical thing inside the capacitor and you can't, there's, you can't really read it. Now, if I would have put that other device on there and we'd have checked dissipation factor and so forth, we may have seen something and we will pull these out and do that later. But good example why you can't just plug something in. All right, let's go over to here. And there's our bulb. Let's turn it on now with everything connected and see what happens. Oop, would help to plug it in, wouldn't it? <clears throat> All right, let's turn this on now. There you go. And the bulb goes right out, and then it comes up a little bit. You can see now that everything powers up and kind of, but it's very, very dim. I don't know if you can even see it down there. See how dim that is? That's how it should be. So, Whatever capacitor was causing the problem, it has now reformed and it seems to be working now. So a little bit more about this. This is why I'm not just relying on the electronic circuit breaker. The circuit breaker will shut this off very quickly, although a very low amp fuse will, could still pop. So 
if you want something to limit the current, not just shut off at a certain current, you need you need a current limiting device. So if you take this apart, that is why you can see there's a big old fat light bulb in there. The, the thing is, this is a 118 watt bulb and I wanted a much smaller one because this thing doesn't draw a lot of current. But anyway, that's how we do this. So combination of the breaker and current limiting, sometimes you need them both. Okay, now let's see what happens when we turn this thing on. Let me flip this. And you can see it trips pretty quick. It goes on and then it goes back off. So that tells me, and I have that great big bulb in there, but that's a little bit of limit, but it's not blowing the fuse. So now what that tells me is I have this trip point set too low. So I'm gonna turn it up just a little bit and we're gonna see what happens. There we go. Okay, so now I think it's safe to go to full power. Let's see what happens. I'm gonna switch this, take the limiting out, and then I am going to focus you on here to see if a fuse blows. No, it does not. And we can see we're still on, and we now have the thing powered up. And the reason I'm gonna leave this circuit breaker on here is if the, this starts to go bad on us, we want it to trip. Okay, where was I? The phone rang. So we have this connected and it's still on. And if we check our voltages here, we have our negative 57 and we have our positive 56 just about. So that's good. And I'm only feeding about 115 volts into this instead of 120. So it's a little bit low. So those voltages are a little off. That's fine. So it looks like what we had was a capacitor that needed to form. And now the unit powers up. So now I think we can go a little further and just see if we can push a signal through it. Another thing I noticed that was really cool was these are the two speaker switching relays. So your, your power amplifier, you come out of the speaker terminals and into this preamp and then it comes through this relay. So this actually has uh, speaker switching and you can see these have those bifurcated contacts, which uh, really, really help with the lifespan of the contacts so they don't arc up. So I go into this a little bit more in a couple of my other videos when we talk about speaker protect relays, but very good. These are not cheap and they're not easy to find. So the good news is they don't go bad quite as often, but we will check them and make sure they're not tarnished or anything. Okay, signal generator is set to one kilohertz. Oscilloscope is set to the output of the preamp. And I flipped it on and it turned on. I'm going into the auxiliary input and this wobbly volume control. Let's turn it up. And we are getting something. How about that? Not bad. And let's see, let's uh, change the scale a little bit. We should be able to get some, okay. Okay, so there's actually sound. There's our balance controls. Okay, so all in all, at least for the, uh, general circuit itself it works so i think it's safe to go through and start doing our restoration well now that was a lot of fun so getting ready to take the faceplate off here taking everything apart to get into it and i noticed that the knob felt kind of funny the the volume control it worked as you saw on the on the previous clip there but if you remember that it was very loose and when you turned the volume up each of the detents would stick it felt funny and then when you turned it back down it moved smoothly and the knob 
was loose inside there so I loosened the set screws and went to pull the knob off and the whole thing came out and I thought that was kind of strange and then I realized that this was whoever put this in really tightened those set screws in there very hard and the aluminum knob combined with this steel shaft this thing was jammed in there so tightly that I literally had to take it down to my shop and put it in a vise to remove it. So long story short this Alps connector is pro or uh, this potentiometer is ruined uh, and even if I were able to put it back together it probably is not going to be right so no worries I have another Alps very similar to this 50k quad gang not a problem but I think I'm going to take this opportunity and I'm going to try something different and what I did was I ha I'm going to try replacing this with an actual stepped attenuator and the difference between a potentiometer and a stepped attenuator is that a potentiometer just has a track a carbon track going around or, or wire wound whatever and there's a wiper that goes along and kind of taps off the resistance whereas a stepped attenuator is actually a, a selector switch that has many many poles on it in other words it'll have like the one I'm going to try has 24 different taps each tap has a small resistor in it and by choosing the resistor it chooses the volume level so it kind of mimics this but in a digital rather than analog sort of man manner I guess you could say and there are calculators that you can go to online where you can actually calculate each resistor so that you can get a logarithmic volume taper when you purchase one of these things pre-assembled they already have done all the homework for you and already chose the, the correct resistors that's another stepped attenuators versus pot you know pots like this is another whole subject for a completely different video we may just do another video on that by itself while we're doing this but for right now I'm gonna get on with the work of getting the rest of this done I'm gonna leave this alone there is a lot of corrosion as you can see here that I have to deal with and generally a lot of crud you can see on the switches themselves how bad they are so it's going to need cleaned up and I'm just going to take my time and clean it up and then of course we'll go through and do the obligatory recap and replace any of the known troublemaker transistors and uh, we'll go from there so let's get on with it all right, I'm starting with the tone amp assembly here, and I'm just kind of going through and cleaning the little contacts first. And I just take a little bit of uh, deoxit, and I'll shoot it into a little cap like that. And then I'll take just a cotton swab like that. Or sometimes I'll use these little Fantastics. They're a little bit more abrasive, and you can see if it's really bad but these ones are pretty clean and I'm just gonna go through and just kinda wipe them off a little bit just like that and I'll do a little neater job off camera but right now with the camera in the way it's kinda difficult but you'll get the idea and you can see it just how much crud comes off when you clean that then when I'm done with that I'll actually get some synthetic grease and I'll put some of that onto a really inexpensive brush like so and I'll go in and the little detents over here I'll go and I'll put some of that in there so that the thing's not so stiff when it's going through the detents just like that
And I think this is going to be an early evening because I got up really early this morning and drove about 200 miles and had two service calls. It's been a busy day. But that's a good thing. All right. So I'll go through and I'll do all these other ones and then we'll go to our next little phase there. Okay, you're just going to have to listen to my unhappy grandson upstairs while we do this. So this particular tone amp board has those some of those 2SA 726s and these are known to have noise issues. They're the ones that get that staticky popping noise and they drift. So it's something you might want to, uh, you're going to want to replace these to kind of be proactive. The other transistors on this board are all good. They usually don't have any problems, but these are very prone to that. And I think you've seen this on other Pioneer gear that I've worked on that we've seen some of these that went bad. So we're going to replace these. And of course, in order to do that, we have to match up some transistors. Now you can see this one I just installed, it looks like it's not matched. You see the VBE tracks way up here instead of down here. But watch as, as it settles and the two transistors reach equilibrium, you'll see this will drop down and it'll be perfectly matched. Now if you have a transistor that's not matched, well let me show you what it looks like with a non-matched one. I, I know I show this in a lot of videos, but I get, you wouldn't believe how many emails I get about this little tester and about matching transistors, so I kind of repeat it every so many videos. But let's get a, let's get a set that are not matched and we'll, we'll show you what it looks like. So here's two transistors that appear to be relatively unmatched. You can see where your VBE track is on there. And the pulses are pretty good. And there's a reason why I'll tell you that in a little bit. But it's, it's coming down now that they're reaching equilibrium. But it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be off a little bit. And this is another KSA 992, but this is a KSA 992 FBU. And the ones that we're testing are KSA 992 FBTA. And I'll have to look that up. Some of those letters mean straight leads versus kinked leads, like these curved. You can see how these have a curve on the leads. So some of those letters mean that. Some of the letters mean the pinout, emitter, base, and collector, what order they're in. Some of them also mean the gain level. So the F, I believe, is the gain. So the first letter after their KSA 992F means the gain level. So technically, even though these transistors are slightly different, they should have very similar gain characteristics. And yep, you can see that one's coming in. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. It's off a little bit. If we wait a little bit longer, maybe it'll get in there sooner or later. And when people talk about thermally coupling the transistors when they're, when they're in a pair, like when you're using in a differential pair or something, this is the reason why. If the temperature is different between the two transistors, they, they will have a different VBE from one another. They'll track different. So let me get another one in there. Okay, here's a pretty badly mismatched pair of transistors, as you can see. The first thing is when we look at the turn on and turn off pulses, you can see how grossly they're out. You can see we're even getting a little bit of overshoot here. All kinds of weird things are happening. And we go down to look at the actual VBE and look what happens there. Huge difference, huh? Crazily mismatched. Now these are both small signal PNP transistors. One of them is the KSA 992. The other one is a 2N3904. And, or I'm sorry, a 2N3906. So you can see the 2N3906 and the KSA 
992 have very different characteristics when it comes to transition frequency and VBE. And no matter how long we leave this in here, they're never going to come together. They're never going to match because the transistors actually have different characteristics. So they don't match up. So this is an extreme example of what mismatched transistors will do. Okay, what I might do is stop and do a little explanation of this transistor tester. Because I get tons of emails. I've had lots of interesting discussions with people about how they work and so forth. So I have a pretty well matched pair of transistors in there at, in the jig at the moment. And what you're looking at is that pulse that I always show you. And what you're seeing right here is there's first of all you have to understand what's going on. I am putting a I have a center tapped transformer attached to this jig. So you have a center tapped AC sine wave that's 24 volts. It's plus and minus 12 volts I believe. And if the transistor is a PNP, then this section will actually show us the VBE. And if it's an NPN, I'm sorry, if it's an NPN, it'll, this one will show you the VBE. And if it's a PNP, this side will show you the, the, the uh, VBE. And what's happening is this first pulse right here, this negative going pulse, this is actually the turn on pulse for the PNP transistor. So if we can expand that a little bit, so we'll just expand it somewhat. What you can see here, let's flip these around. Okay, hard to get this in there. So what you're seeing right here is as that AC sine wave goes from zero volts and starts starts climbing okay in voltage eventually you're going to get past the forward voltage drop of the base to emitter of one of the two transistors remember no two transistors are a hundred percent perfect as far as matching one another they're going to have slight slight differences whichever one has the lower forward voltage drop between the base and the emitter is going to turn on first because as that AC sine wave is increasing it's going to cross through that forward voltage drop and then the transistor will begin to conduct. So the one with the lower VBE will turn on first and for that split second in time the other transistor is going to be turned off and because this this little circuit is nothing but a similar to a Wheatstone bridge circuit there will the difference between the two transistors will show up as an, an error voltage so while the one transistor is turning on and the other one is not on yet you'll have this little spike as that AC sine wave continues to, to, to rise eventually you'll hit the second VBE of the higher VBE transistor and it will turn on once it turns on then the two voltages will cancel out and that's where you see this pulse dropping down to zero and eventually those will both drop out and the only thing that you'll see during this pulse right here is going to be the difference in VBE between the two transistors. As that sine wave goes through its crest and then starts to go back down towards zero volts as you cross through and drop below the higher VBE <laughs> voltage drop of the higher transistor, that transistor will turn off. And then what you'll see is a spike in voltage once again because you have one transistor on and another one off. And you'll see this little anomaly here, this little spike. And all of this has to do with how the transistor turns on and turns off. So things like slew rate and Miller capacitance and the actual curve of the sine wave voltage itself will all affect that. Long story short, two very, very well, uh, in theory, a perfectly matched 
pair of transistors would never have these pulses. They would be either extremely minimal, showing the error of my test jig itself, or they would just be a flat line because they would both turn on exactly at the same time and turn off at exactly the same time. So the long story short, the smaller these pulses are, the more well matched the transistors are. The larger these pulses are, the more mismatched they are. And typically when you see a very large pulse on either side, you'll see this VBE be very off as well. It, it won't be tracking across the zero volts. Now if I go way up in resolution here, I'll turn this down a little bit, you can see, if I can get the thing to trigger properly, you can see your VBE right here. So here's the turn on, here's the turn off. I've just expanded it way up on the volts per division. And you can see that right here, this fuzziness right here, are the two transistors both turned on at the same time. And you're looking at the actual difference in VBE between the two transistors. What you'll normally see is this nice little curvy pattern here. And it should, right at the center of it, it should cross as close to zero volts as possible. So if I turn this down to, turn this to ground right here, and I set this right on the zero volt line, and I turn it back on, right there is your VBE. So it's just a tiny little bit mismatched between the two transistors. Remember, we're talking 10 millivolts per division. So we're looking at just a couple of millivolts difference, you know, a couple thousandths of a volt. It's not a big difference. In a really badly matched set, this can be tens of millivolts, and uh, the VBE mismatch will be really bad. Now, strangely enough, an observation I've made is if we get a pair of transistors where this is right on the line and these two pulses are perfectly matched to one another, the turn on and turn off, what I've found is that they will also tend to be very well matched with HFE or with beta or with gain, whatever you want to call it for the transistor. This is not, this does not test HFE, but it gives you an indication that they're going to be matched in HFE as well. So if I take these off and I put them both in, in uh, you know, a tester to test the HFE, you'll find that they're going to be very close to one another. So this is an interesting little test circuit that I have. And I've been using it for a couple years now, and I've been having extremely good results. So that's why I kind of use it now a lot. And there's our pulses again. And again, if you can, in this test jig, you can put a PNP or an NPN transistor in there, and it will, it will compare either one. So I could, I could throw a pair of NPNs in there, and it would do the same thing, except you would just see the VBE on this side instead of on this side. That's all. Because one of them works off of the negative going portion of the sine wave, the other goes off of the positive going portion of the sine wave. That's all. All right, hope that doesn't confuse you more, but uh, that's kind of my uh, explanation of how this thing works. All right, so a lot of you ask about how I desolder and replace components on PC boards like this, and it's really not very exciting. <laughs> I have the uh, desoldering tool, and it's pretty simple. You Put it on the transistor here. If I can do it around the camera. And you just remove all of the solder. And out comes the transistor. Now, you can also use desolder braid. And if you'd like to see that, I'll do one of those. This is a little more traditional manner or you can use a desoldering pump. Um, so I'll take a couple out with this. So this one, the first thing I like to do is I'll get a little bit of flux, either from a flux pen or just, you know, some liquid. I'll just put a little bit on there like that. That just helps to remove the solder. This stuff never has enough flux in it by itself. It just kind of makes it a little harder. So you just go right in here, 
and it pulls it right off. There you go. And you can see that does a pretty good job as well. You can go down and do this next one. Just like so. There you go. And just for giggles and grins, we'll use a little desoldering pump. And that you just kind of heat this up real quick, pop it, and you're good to go. And that's it. Not too exciting, is it? And there's your 2SA726. And again, these get noisy. Um, I don't know what it is about these, but everyone, every, everyone that has these, you'll get one every now and then. One of the transistors will fail, and it'll it'll either short you know and you'll get that loud popping noise or you'll get that static and that hiss uh, it's just the 2SA 726's and a, a few others but the, they're the big culprits on the Pioneer gear so if you have them I highly recommend for how just absolutely inexpensive these KSA 992's are these are really really good transistors I never have these come back I never have problems with them so put those in you're good to go and they're low noise transistors they're very good another thing to watch out for on these these pinouts are different this one is base collector emitter and this is emitter collector base okay I believe hold on yes so sorry about hitting the camera so BCE and ECB so what that means is when you put this in in the amplifier, if you look over here, and I'll zoom you in, when you replace these, hope it focuses, these were oriented this direction. So, kind of like with the flat facing that way. But if you notice with the new one, it's facing the opposite direction. So you always beware of that. Whenever you're using a substitute transistor, never, never take for granted that the pinouts are going to be the same. They may be different. When you run into big problems is when the, the holes in the circuit board are drilled in a straight line. When they're in a triangle like that, you can configure them pretty much any way and, and they'll fit. But if they're, if they're in a straight line, you might have to bend a pin around. You don't want to do that. That's where you have to really be careful to get not only a suitable transistor but a suitable pinout for that transistor as well just things to look out for so I'm going to go ahead and put these in emitter collector and base and you can see the emitter the collector and the base don't always trust the silk screening on the board because sometimes they get it wrong most of the time Pioneer is extremely good at not messing that up the Sansui's that I've worked on, more than once I've seen the screening be incorrect because Sansui does a lot of swapping of components during their production runs. So that's something you have to, again, look out for. So let me get these in. I'll show you how I solder them. So first thing I'll do is I'll make sure that they're in there straight and that they're not crooked on the board. And I'll just crop these down just a little bit like this. I crop them, you know, you can be a little bit naughty if you want and crop them after you solder them, but what will happen is the zinc plating or the tin plating or silver plating on the leads, when you cut it off it leaves the copper exposed on the end. So if you solder it in afterwards, which some of these I'll do, some of them when I'm in a hurry, especially if it's a lower end unit, I don't worry about it. Um, if you solder it, when you put this in like so, it actually will absorb the solder into the end of the lead and that will actually help it not to tarnish. Okay, and my transistor's still in there really, really straight. So we'll go ahead and we'll do these last two. Just like that. And that's it. That's all there is to it. 
And then once that's like that, we can go ahead and clean it up, clean all the flux off, and that'll be good. And let me do this other one, and we'll be good to go. Now that we have those properly soldered in there, we just come in with a little bit of alcohol, and I'm looking through the camera as I'm doing this, so I'm kind of <laughs> blind. But we go in and we just clean off that flux. And it's really not important because the flux core solder, that flux is non-corrosive that we use nowadays. But, you know, I just like it to look neat, especially if it's a higher end piece of gear. Um, you want it to look neat. So there you go. Now, another thing you can do, you notice this board has a lot of flux on it all over the place, and it's pretty nice and shiny. And what will happen is, if there's a little lead there, and what will happen is if you get alcohol on there, it'll kind of wrinkle it up and then it'll get like some of, some of them will get like a hazing, a white hazing. It looks really ugly. So what, what you can do sometimes is you can just drizzle some alcohol on there, some like uh, anhydrous that doesn't have any water in it. So anhydrous isopropyl and just let it flood. It'll melt the solder and flow it. And once it reflows it like that just let it evaporate and then it'll be shiny like that again or you can also use uh, flux remover spray and just put a little bit of that on there and just let it spread out and it'll dry and it'll just put a nice even sheen on the board and make it look nice and you won't have that white hazy stuff on the back of the board okay there's our other set can you tell where they are all set so now we're ready to do the capacitors well a messy bench always is an indicator of a happy Tony so <laughs> we got the top part of this done we got it recapped all of the offending transistors that uh, may cause us future problems have been replaced and we're gonna move on now before we flip this thing over and start on the boards on the bottom with dealing with this broken potentiometer. And I'm going to try something different this time. I went on eBay and I ordered one of these. And this is called a stepped attenuator, which those aren't anything new. But this one <clears throat> is made by a company called EIZZ. Of course, it's a foreign-made thing over in China, I believe. But it looks like it's pretty good quality. The price of this is a fraction of what a stepped attenuator would normally cost. And don't worry, we'll do a separate little video on the difference between a stepped attenuator and an actual analog potentiometer. But a couple of things that impressed me with this was the gold-plated pins the metal housing and the fact that inside this they are using very high precision surface mount SMT resistors. This is supposed to be a pretty good quality product. I don't know. I've never tried one. I have not really known anything about it. I tried to look on some of the forums like DIY Audio and Audio Karma. There were a few people that commented on these that they thought they were pretty good but Really, I know nobody personally that's used these, so I thought this would be a great opportunity to try one, especially for the price. So again, if you look these part numbers up on eBay or on Amazon, I believe, or several other places, I know there's a lot of sites you can order these. And uh, I don't know, it's pretty heavy too. It looks like pretty good quality. So I'm gonna install this and we'll talk more about these later, like I said. And then we'll be ready to flip, give this thing a quick test and flip it over and start doing the bottom part. All right, we got our stepped attenuator installed and we have the thing put back together and powered up. And of course the bottom part, none of the switches or anything have been cleaned. They're a little bit dirty, but we'll see what we get. There we go. All right, let's start turning this thing up and see what it does here, huh? Well, that's a positive sign. OK. 
Okay. <laughs> right in the clipping there. Okay. So it's all good. Very good. Everything looks good. It's working. And I think we can move on to the bottom part of this thing now.